Hey guys, um, it's been a long while since I've made a video because for a while I just had like, I don't know, like you know they call it writing block but like I'm not writing so I had a creative block and I just didn't know what to post so I kind of stopped posting for a while um, and then recently had an idea to um, make a video about my heart condition and just to kind of talk about it. Um, if you're friends with me on any of my social media, you've heard me talk about it a little bit um, because it's an extremely huge part of my life, but I wanted to go a little bit more in depth and kind of explain what my heart condition is, um, how it affects me, if there's a fix for it, um, how it all started, um, and just kind of where I'm at. So if you want to hear about that and if that's something that you're interested in learning anything about then I guess keep watching and if not well I hope you have a good day I have my heart condition um, IST which is inappropriate sinus tachycardia which started two years ago but if we rewind a little bit before that um, to about four or five years ago um, I started to show signs if I could speak um, of having an autoimmune disorder um, and for a long while we thought that I might have lupus we're still not entirely sure um, I'm actually getting ready to go have specialized blood work done to help determine that but when that all started it all started out with a rash on my arms came out of nowhere um, and it started in the crease of my arm and then the next thing I knew from the tips of my fingers up my shoulders across my chest and down my other arm were covered in a rash. Um, of course, at first, doctors thought it was eczema. It wasn't. Um, I've tried six different steroid creams, steroid shots. Um, they even biopsied a patch on my knee of that rash and still couldn't figure out what it was. Um, and so from there, I had the rash for about a year and it would not go away. It burned so badly. At one point, I had a butterfly rash across my face and um, right before I was about to travel overseas to Bulgaria, I actually got a huge rash on my chin. Super painful. Um, and no one could figure out what was wrong. And from there, my symptoms just got worse. I had um, consistent migraines for two years and um, the medicines that I tried made me feel horrible, so eventually I just stopped taking them and just kind of dealt with it. Um, my body aches all the time. Um, I have vertigo really badly, um, along with several other symptoms that go along with multiple autoimmune diseases, but every time I would get my blood drawn, I would have a positive ANA, which is an antibody that they use to help diagnose autoimmune disorders, but the other tests that they did would never show up positive, so they couldn't ever diagnose me. Um, and so for the past four or five years, I've been going to multiple different doctors, having different tests done, all this kind of stuff to see if we could figure out what autoimmune disorder I had and if there was any way for me to get medicine for it or to start treating it or to just have a diagnosis um, just so that you know I could put a name to what I was going through instead of just saying well I have all these problems I don't know what causes them um, and so to this day we're still trying to figure out what autoimmune disorder I have my doctor is convinced that I do have one she's just not sure which one it is um, the specialized blood work that I'm having done is gonna test for lupus, Sjogren's, and then she's gonna check me for a mixed connective tissue disorder. We're hopeful that something will show up um, and that I can get some answers or some relief in one way or another. Um, and on top of that, <laughs> so I live in Arizona and in Arizona, we have a lot of weeds, we have a lot of mesquite trees, and we have a lot of different types of grass. I got an allergy panel done. I'm allergic to every type of grass that grows in Arizona. One of my highest and worst allergies is mesquite trees. And if you've ever been to Arizona, you know that mesquite trees are everywhere. And 
I'm just legitimately allergic to everything that grows in Arizona, which has resulted in my autoimmune disorder because my immune system is constantly attacked every day, 24 seven, because of the environment that I live in. And my body has never had a time to recoup and strengthen itself. And so it's just kind of gone in a downward tailspin. And when that happens and your immune system is compromised for that long, um, that is a place where a lot of autoimmune disorders come from. Um, autoimmune disorders do also run in my family. Um, my mom has Hashimoto's and her mom had MS, I think. Um, so autoimmune disorders do run in my family and can be hereditary. Um, so we kind of figured for the last several years that I had an autoimmune disorder. We just didn't know which one because all of my tests show up negative. So that in and of itself has been frustrating, but it's been so long that that aspect of it, I've learned to deal with it and I've just kind of accepted that I feel sick every day, my body aches every day, um, all that kind of stuff, and that's just kind of how my life is. Um, but I've kind of accepted it and just moved past it, and if I get answers, I get answers. If not, I'll still be frustrated, but there's not much that I can do. Fast forward to 2017 um, there is a history of um, cardiac problems in my family my mom had um, SVT which is sup supraventricular tachycardia um, and she had two um, ablations that fixed it and my younger brother Connor had um, SVT as well and had an ablation that fixed it um, my dad also had um, issues with high blood pressure and tachycardia that he was able to um, subside those things by changing his diet and um, taking some different herbal supplements. So there is a history of cardiac problems in my family. I've never had an issue at this point in 2017. I had never prior to that had an issue with my heart. Um, I was a gymnast for the first 12 years of my life um, and was decently active and hiked miles with my family and did all this super fun stuff. The end of June 2017, I went to work, you know, just a normal day, and about 45 minutes into my shift, I start to get really, really hot and clammy, and I get dizzy, and my hearing goes out, and my ears are ringing, and I'm just like, what in the world is going on? But I'm like whatever it's fine you know it's hot in here but it's fine and so I finished doing my job I remember taking a pizza because I worked at a pizza place at the time um, and dropping it off at a table and then I come back and I look at my manager and I'm like is our AC broken again it is so hot in here and he looks at me with the most confused look on his face and says no our AC is working perfectly fine um, and it's actually really cold in here and um, I was like, really? Are you sure? And he said, yeah, I'm positive. The dude came out and fixed it two days ago and it's not hot in here. And so then I was like, well, this is weird. And I had eaten, I'd stayed hydrated, I slept well the night before, and so I'm like, what could it be? So I go to one of our computers and I decide I'm gonna check my pulse and check my heart rate. And my heart rate was in the 140s while I was standing on my feet. Um, we weren't busy, it was actually super dead. And so, there was no reason for my heart rate to be in the 140s. I was like, okay, well, that's concerning. And so I told my manager, I'll be like, I'm like, I'll be right back. I'm gonna go call my mom and see what she thinks. So I call my mom and she's like, well, that's kind of strange. Um, if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't come down in a little bit, you probably need to go into the ER. And I'm like, okay. So I go on my break and it just keeps getting worse and worse and I'm feeling horrible, I'm feeling lightheaded, I'm feeling like I'm not gonna be able to drive home. I was nauseous, I couldn't breathe, I was shaky. And at that point I told my manager, I have to go home. I don't know what's wrong, but I have to go home. So I go home and am um, laying in the recliner in the living room with my feet up, drinking water, the AC's going, trying to calm my body down my heart rate would not it would not come down and so at that point my parents were like no you need to go 
at least over to the fire station and have them run an EKG and check you out and see what's going on. So I did go to the fire station. They're like, yeah, you need to go to the ER. So they take me to the ER by ambulance. In that week, I went to the ER. The e I went to the ER four times. The paramedics came to the house once. And I think I went to the fire station two other times to have them run an EKG and check me out. Um, and it just was not getting better. Um, and from that point on for the next a month and a half after that, I legitimately spent every day, every second that I was awake, laying in my bed watching Netflix. If I got up, if I moved, if I sat up, my heart rate would spike and it would not come back down and I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was gonna puke and it was horrible. The one time that the paramedics actually came to the house is the one and only time in my entire life that I've thought that I was gonna die. <laughs> And that was just because um, my, my hands were clenched shut and my arms were clenched to my sides and I couldn't lift them up and then my face started to go numb. Turns out it was just because I was hyperventilating because I was panicked and so then I wasn't getting enough oxygen and my body was panicking so it was sending all of my blood to like my important organs. Um, and so that was the only time that I've ever felt like I was dying but that was terrifying. Finally, after a month and a half of being out of work, I ended up having to quit my job um, and spending every day in bed. I went to a cardiologist, they put me on a halter monitor, um, which is basically just a mobile heart monitor. Um, depending on which one you get, there's one that sticks to your chest right here and then there's another one that has um, three leads and it all transmits wirelessly. And they get my data back and they're like, well, something's not right because you have tachycardia at unnecessary, at unnecessary times and it's getting up super high. Um, and so they do all of their tests, they do blood work, they did an ultrasound of my heart. Um, I think at one point I had a contrast CT done. Um, they found that I have a small heart murmur, but that doesn't really mean anything. And I got referred to an electrophysiologist up in Tucson. Um, and basically, an electrophysiologist is just a cardiologist, but he j only deals with the electrical side of what goes on with your heart, the electrical impulses and stuff. Um, and um, at that point had been diagnosed with inappropriate sinus tachycardia. It was nice to have a diagnosis until I found out that the diagnosis of inappropriate sinus tachycardia is actually an extremely generic diagnosis that you're given by a cardiologist when they don't know what's wrong um, and they don't know why you're having tachycardia. Hence the name, inappropriate sinus tachycardia. Um, so at that point, they put me on um, Corlinor, which is a beta blocker. Um, the medicine itself, Corlinor, is usually given to patients who are in heart failure, but it also works extremely well to block your body from processing adrenaline um, and helps prevent the tachycardia and keep your heart rate within normal ranges, which for a healthy adult is anywhere from 60 to 100. Um, is a normal resting heart rate. So um, at that point, they gave me the Corlinor. I went to the electrophysiologist and things seemed to be going well. Um, I took the Corlinor for several months until I had a breakthrough and it no longer worked. My body built up an immunity, um, which my body does to most medicines. Um, I can take them for a while and then I have to stop or change medicines because my body just decides it doesn't like them anymore. So after Corlinor, they put me on Verapamil, and Verapamil kind of worked, but it made me feel absolutely horrible. It was one of the worst medicines that I have ever been on. Um, after the Verapamil, they put me on one other medicine that I do not remember what it was called, um, and that one worked for a little bit, and it started to make me feel terrible, and wasn't controlling my tachycardia as well as I needed it to, so we switched. Again, the next medicine they put me on was Pindolol, which is also a beta blocker. And that was the medicine I had the most success with. Um, I felt pretty good on it. There were minimal side effects. I think one of the only major side effects was weight gain. I think I gained like 10 pounds, which wasn't a big deal. Um, and I was on that medicine for six months, seven months before it stopped working. Um, and 
that was the medicine that I had the most success with. When it stopped working, I would just up my dose a little bit and I felt pretty good. Um, and then you fast forward to when the Pindolol stopped working. And at that point, um, I had had my heart problem for just about two years and I went to my electrophysiologist and told him it wasn't working and he said, well at this point, one of our only options is to do an ablation um, because the problem with beta blockers is while they drop your heart rate, they also can drop your blood pressure. And Pindolol was one of the beta blockers that was supposed to do the least to my blood pressure, but it would still drop me to 90 over 60 and sometimes lower, which gets dangerous. Um, and so he really didn't want to put me on a new beta blocker. So um, at that point, we discussed our options and we went ahead and scheduled the ablation for October of um, last year, so 2018. Um, and at this point I was hopeful. I was hopeful that I was, it had been two years and I was going to be done. I was not going to have any more problems. It was all just, it was all just going to be over with. I was going to be normal. I was going to be able to work as much as I wanted and do whatever I wanted and I wouldn't feel bad and I wouldn't have all these side effects. And that was the mindset that I went into this ablation with. I have the ablation. Surgery went great. I get home and for about the first two weeks, I felt really good despite being sore um, from the surgery. And then after two weeks, I start to notice that my heart rate is creeping back up. Now I knew that the first six weeks after the surgery, even the first six months were kind of iffy because your heart is still healing because with an ablation, they go in with a camera and a catheter um, in through your arteries and they actually burn off muscle inside of your heart. So it takes a while for your muscle to heal and for the scar tissue to form and for your heart to learn how to beat without that area of your heart. I tried to stay optimistic and I tried to remind myself your body's healing, give it time, it might get better, just give it time. And so six weeks passes and I'm still not feeling a whole lot better. And then around the two month mark, I start to have dizzy spells. And not just like minor dizzy spells, but dizzy spells to the point where I get tunnel vision, my hearing goes out, I get hot and clammy, I get dizzy and I start to fall over. Um, I'm basically in pre-syncope, which is pr like where I'm about to pass out. And at first those episodes were few and far between and then they just became more and more consistent. Um, so I started to monitor my heart rate during those episodes and found out that while I'm up on my feet at work, moving around for four or five hours at a time, my body gets to a point where it just can't handle it anymore. My heart gets stressed and my heart rate plummets and it'll plummet into the low, low 40s and that is what is causing these dizzy pre um episodes. And so at that point, I was concerned, but they weren't happening often enough for me to really do anything about it um, until I started to do research and learned that when you have tachycardia and bradycardia, because your heart is never really consistent, your vital organs don't get as much blood and oxygen as they need, and it can start to cause a whole slew of other problems but also with that bradycardia, you're at increased risk for blood clots, stroke, heart attack, all this bad stuff. Um, it got to the point where I had to, I'm currently to the point where um, I had to go down to two days at work and I can't work my full shifts and they're not even long shifts. They're four hour shifts and I cannot work them because my body just can't handle it. Um, so I decide I'm gonna go make an appointment with my electrophysiologist and I go and see him and he puts me on a heart monitor for a month. And this is the most frustrating part. After talking to him about these episodes, after telling him about these episodes, after being on the heart monitor for a month, basically his answer to me was, it's not bad enough yet for us to do anything about it, so just keep waiting and see if it gets worse. 
which frustrated me to no end. Uh, but I was kind of expecting him to have that answer. So at this point, the things I know is that I don't want to keep waiting to see if it gets worse because that'll be detrimental to my health and my safety. Um, and that with having what they call tacky Brady syndrome, the only fix is to have a pacemaker, which for a very long time I was not stoked about and I had a really hard time accepting it. I've gotten to the point where now I would prefer that they just put a pacemaker in me and fix me so that I can be normal and I can work and I can do things and I don't feel bad all the time. Um, and so since I got to the point of accepting the pacemaker for him to come back and say, we're not going to do anything right now was just really frustrating because I'd worked so hard to make myself okay with this. Um, and so here I am today. Um, I had that conversation with my electrophysiologist just last week. I had an appointment yesterday with my PCP. Um, I have a referral to see a new electrophysiologist and a couple of other doctors to try and fix some of my other health issues. Um, autoimmune disorders, extreme environmental allergies, all that kind of stuff to hopefully get me feeling better. Um, I'm also going to be increasing my iron, my vitamin B12, and my vitamin C um, and in hopes that that will help subside some of my symptoms. So that's where I'm at. Um, that's where my story starts and that's where it is to current. Living like this with a chronic illness that does not go away, that doesn't really get better, is extremely, extremely hard. Um, I can sleep for 12 hours straight and wake up the next day and be absolutely exhausted and feel like I didn't get any sleep at all. Um, some nights I don't sleep at all because my tachycardia keeps me up, my heart rate spikes in my sleep, it's gotten up to 200 beats um, couple, a couple of times and it wakes me up, or if my heart rate drops too low, which when I sleep, my heart rate drops into the um, 30s, the lowest it's gotten so far is 36 beats per minute. When it drops that low, my body wakes me up to try and bring my heart rate back up. So a lot of nights I don't sleep. Um, I feel sick all the time, I don't have any energy, I still get headaches. Um, most days I can't breathe, I feel like I've constantly ran a marathon and like my body is continually trying to bring my heart rate down but it just can't and so I can't breathe as a result of that. Um, everyday tasks are exhausting. Putting on pants takes all of my energy out of me and it wins me. Um, most days I don't do my hair. Today is the first day in two weeks that I have actually done my hair and put makeup on so hooray for that. Um, I prefer to take baths over showers because it is a lot easier. Um, I can't walk my dog without getting winded. I can't carry my baby sister through a parking lot without getting winded. Most days my heart rate does not go below 110 or 115. That's usually where my resting heart rate sits at. Um, I have to drink over 100 um, ounces of water a day to keep my hydration up. But along with that 100 ounces of water, I also have to make sure I'm doing electrolytes and salt so that my body can properly absorb it. Um, if I decide to clean my room, um, I know that that's going to be one of the only things that I can do that day because it's going to take all of my energy and it's going to exhaust me and it's going to be extremely difficult. Um, I'm nauseous all the time. I have extreme vertigo. Um, I'm car sick when I'm not in a car. I'm even more car sick when I am in a car on long road trips. Um, it's horrible. Um, walking through Target, I have to be the one to push the cart so that I can lean on it because walking for long periods of time is exhausting. Um, basically any everyday task that most normal people can do without issue is extremely, extremely difficult for me to do. Um, and learning to live with that has been one of the most frustrating things on the face of this planet. Um, not being able to work as much as I want, being stressed about medical bills, being stressed about, you know, phone bills, car insurance, gas in my car, being able to buy the things that I need is extremely stressful. Um, and it's extremely difficult just all around. Um. But if I had one piece of advice for you, 
if you ever if you ever meet someone or if you know someone who struggles with a chronic illness um, that doesn't feel well all the time or that you ask to hang out all the time but they never feel well enough to do and you feel like they just don't care about your friendship or they're always skipping out or um, like they'd rather sleep than hang out with you. I can promise you that that is not and never will be the case. They value you, they love you, and it kills them that they cannot just hang out on demand whenever or just do whatever or have, you know, sleepovers or go out of their routine. Because I know for me, I wish so badly that I could just, on a whim, go hike a mountain or go rollerblading or play tennis or I don't know pretty much hang out with anybody at any given time but I don't because I physically am too exhausted um if I choose that I'm gonna hang out with someone I know that that is going to use all of my energy for the day and that once I'm done with that I'm gonna be in bed for the rest of the day and so with someone who has a chronic illness they're not avoiding you they do love you but their body makes it extremely hard for them to be able to just go do things or to stay out late or to get up early. Um, and so my advice to you would be to try the best you can from where you're at and with the understanding that you have to understand, to support, and to love that person with through what they're going through. Um, understand that when they say they can't hang out, they're not doing it because they don't want to hang out with you. Um, they're doing it because they know that if they force their body to give more energy, that it's going to ruin their tomorrow or it's going to ruin the rest of their day. Um, so just try your best to be understanding and to love them through it and to support them. Um, because a lot of times, at least what I've found with what I go through on a day-to-day -day basis is that a lot of people just assume that I'm lazy. They assume that I don't want to work and that I just want to lay in bed all the time. And that is wrong on so many levels and that frustrates me the most because with chronic illness, with IST, with autoimmune disorders, you cannot just push through it. It doesn't work that way. Um, it doesn't. I mean, if I just pushed through and worked an eight-hour work day, I would pass out it, cause it I get to that point at work um, where I just have to go home because I've fallen at work I've fallen into walls I've fallen into um, uh, big rolling metal trays um, and it's just not safe and it doesn't make us feel good and we know our bodies and we know what's best and so to say that we're being lazy or we're not trying hard enough or we just don't want to hang out or we just don't want to work 40 hours or whatever not only is extremely hurtful to us but it's also not true we know our bodies and we have to respect our bodies and we can't push our bodies past what they have to give because it's not good for us it's detrimental to our health it makes our days worse than they already are and most people don't understand that and that gets really frustrating um you know i didn't want to go down to two days of work two days a week at work. Does that make sense? I hope so. Um, but it's what my body can handle. So it's what I have to do. Um, and looking for new jobs is extremely difficult because you have to find a job that you can do that's not going to stress your body out, that's not going to push you to a limit that you can't handle. But a lot of employers aren't as gracious when it comes to health issues to be like, oh, you've been here for an hour and you need to go sit down. Great, why did I hire you? And you know, and at least for me with the work ethic that I have and the way that I was raised, it kills me to do that. But again, it's something that I have to do to respect the limits that my body can handle. Um, so, People with chronic illnesses and people who are sick all the time and ha who have constant health issues are not lazy and they want to hang out with you, but they also have to respect the limits that their body has. And so if you can learn to respect that and to love and support them through that, 
you could be my best friend, honestly. Um, I've found very few people that are willing to accept that and meet me where I'm at um, and understand that I just can't push myself sometimes and I just can't do things. Um, those few people that I have found that have chosen to understand that and to work through that or people who also have a chronic illness like my friend Parker who understands because she goes through the same thing as I do. Um, those are lifetime friends that I am extremely grateful for and that a lot of times I feel like I don't deserve because they get the brunt of a lot of my bad days and they hear me complain a lot and they hear me cry a lot and I just love them so much for being willing to put up with me and to love me through that and my family I'm super blessed to um, have parents and siblings that all understand what I go through and don't hold it against me and don't act like I'm a burden even though some days I feel like a burden because chronic illness is extremely isolating and makes you feel very lonely even when you're not um, so I'm blessed to have that kind of a support system but you know um, I'm always open to anyone that wants to learn and wants to understand where I'm at um, and to people that don't want to understand where I'm at and want to say I'm being lazy and that I don't try hard enough or that I'm being dramatic or that I'm faking it I just hold the door for them as they walk out of my life because we don't need that kind of negativity so yeah that is my story um I am going to hopefully be making a couple of other videos relating to this topic probably talking about um I don't know maybe how I got my diagnosis what my doctors are doing to help subside my symptoms um how I cope how I do things differently um maybe what my everyday life is like um uh, maybe tips and tricks to help reduce your tachycardia um I don't know um, I'm still thinking on it. Uh, so if you like this video and you thought that it was cool to learn about someone else's life and you want to learn more about what it's like to live with a chronic illness and what it's like to live with um, an incurable heart condition, um, then you can subscribe to me, my channel. Um, and uh, give this video a like so that more people can see it and so that um, more young girls my age who have chronic illness can maybe find this video and realize that they're not alone and that there's another 23 year old out there who feels like most of her life has been completely stolen from her and who is trying to remain positive in the midst of it all. So thanks for listening. I'm sure this video is gonna be pretty long um, and I know there's a lot of maybe boring information in here, but um, if you listen through the entire thing, thank you. Um, because being able to tell my story and kind of share what I'm going through and kind of give a different point of view to other people um, is something that really helps me and benefits me and makes my days go a little bit easier. And I always enjoy educating people um, so that they have a better understanding as well. So I hope you got something out of it and I hope that you have a great day or night or morning or evening or whatever time it is when you watch this. I just hope you have a great day um, and I will talk to you guys later. But again, thank you for listening because it means a lot to me. So see ya.